Good evening, and thank you to everyone for being here tonight. My name is Elliot Dolby Shields, and I'm an attorney who represents Crystal Chapman, the mother of Raleigh Gred, in connection with an incident that occurred on November 27, 2013, where Mr. Red and two of his teammates on the Edison Tech varsity basketball team were arrested by Rochester police officers while waiting at their bus stop for a school bus to pick them up and transport them to a basketball game at Aquinas High School. 16-year-old sophomore Raleigh no, Gred and two other Edison Tech teammates say they were waiting for a school bus this morning on a corner downtown. That's when a Rochester police officer told them they were loitering. A cop just came over there. He uh, told us to move. Then when we was walking away, he turned around. Yeah, we turned around and then he arrested all of us. Red, 16-year-old junior Daquan Kerlock and 17-year-old senior Wantage Weathers are charged with disorderly conduct. They were arrested and booked. Unfortunately, because of the unconstitutional actions of the Rochester police officers, Mr. Red never made it to Aquinas for his basketball game on that day. Specifically, on November 27th, 2013, the day before Thanksgiving, Mr. Red did absolutely everything right. As a 15-year-old sophomore, Mr. Red was the captain of the Edison Tech varsity basketball team and so he arrived at the bus stop early to set a good example for his teammates. After he arrived downtown, Mr. Red met up with two of his other teammates and they bought snacks and drinks at a store and then exited the store to wait at their designated bus stop. Shortly after exiting the store, Mr. Red and his two teammates were approached by a police officer who told them that they could not stand at that location. When the officer approached Mr. Red and his two teammates and ordered them to move along, they'd done absolutely nothing wrong. Mr. Red and his two teammates attempted to explain to the officer that they were members of the Edison Tech varsity basketball team and that they were simply waiting for their bus. But the officer refused to listen and again told them that they could not stand at that location. Mr. Red and his two teammates complied with the officer's orders and they moved several yards away from their bus stop where they chatted and continued to wait for their bus. After several minutes, however, the same police officer approached Mr. Red a second time and said, I thought I just told you that you can't stand here. After attempting to explain that they were simply waiting for the school bus a second time, the officer again ordered them to move. Mr. Red and his teammates again complied with the officer's orders and began to walk even further away from their bus stop. While Mr. Red and his two teammates were walking, the officer suddenly yelled at Mr. Red to stop and then approached him and order, ordered him to put his hands behind his back. Mr. Red was then handcuffed and arrested, despite the fact that he had not committed a crime or violated the law in any way. After handcuffing and arresting Mr. Red and his teammates, the officers unlawfully searched inside of his pockets in his gym bag. The only things they found during that unlawful search were his basketball sneakers and his Edison Tech varsity basketball jersey, confirming the fact that they were waiting for their bus to transport them to their basketball game. At this point, after Mr. Red's story had been confirmed, any reasonable police officer would have realized that he did not have any lawful reason to arrest Mr. Red and his two friends and would have released them from custody. Instead, Mr. Red and his teammates were put into the back of police cars. After he was in the back of the police car, Mr. Red noticed that other members of the Edison Tech varsity basketball team had begun to arrive at the bus stop and could see that he had been arrested. Around that time, their coach also arrived at the scene and spoke with the police officers about why his players were being arrested. When their coach told the officers that Mr. Red had done nothing wrong and pleaded with the officers to release Mr. Red and his two teammates, the officers told the coach that if he did not get out of the way, he would too be arrested. In fact, one of the police officers told Coach Scott that if he had a big enough caravan, he would, quote, arrest all of you, unquote. Mr. Red was then transported to the downtown police station where he was illegally searched and forced to sit on a bench for many hours before being released from police custody. Thereafter, Mr. Red was forced to appear in criminal court on two occasions before all the false criminal charges were dismissed in their entirety. So we're here today to announce that we filed a civil rights lawsuit on behalf of Mr. Red. My client has decided to file this lawsuit because she wants justice for her son. Justice in this case is not simply obtaining monetary comp compensation for the wrongs that Mr. Red was subjected to. Justice in this case 
means fighting to ensure that there are no more Rally Reds. Fighting to ensure that this does not happen to any more young men in the city of Rochester. Unfortunately, incidents like this happen all too often in Rochester, such as the unlawful arrests of Emily Good, Benny War, and Emily Hardaway, which is why there's a division between the community and the police. Justice for Mr. Red would include the city of Rochester recognizing that this arrest was part of a larger pattern and using this case as a catalyst for improving the relations between the community and the police. The slogan of the Rochester Police Department is policing in the spirit of service, which is meant to represent the Rochester Police Department's commitment to consistently provide excellent police services to all citizens of the Rochester community. I've experienced firsthand the excellent police services of the Rochester police officers. My father was shot and robbed one summer less than a block from my house. The police worked quickly to find, the arrest, to find and arrest the shooter who was prosecuted and eventually spent time in prison. Our family was grateful for their hard work and professionalism of the officers, which is what we expect from all of our police officers every day. And for the most part, a majority of police officers bring honor to the profession and carry out their duties in a lawful manner. But the minority of officers that repeatedly violate citizens' constitutional rights bring down the entire department. So justice in this case would certainly include working to reform the Rochester Police Department to ensure that proper supervision, oversight, and disciplinary measures are implemented so that officers who repeatedly violate the rights of citizens are properly punished and cannot continue to violate the constitutional rights of Rochesterians. Injustice would also include fighting to change the way that the Rochester Police Department goes about its work to ensure that other innocent young men are not unlawfully stopped, searched, and arrested when they've done absolutely nothing wrong. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, you were talking earlier about um, the FBI doing an investigation of this case. Can you talk a little bit about that? So, all that I can say about the FBI investigation is that in July um, of last summer, uh, my client Crystal contacted me and let me know that she had received a telephone call from an investigator. Um, she said, you know, I refused to speak with him and told him to direct all questions to you. So later that day I got a call from the investigator and um, the investigator was with the uh, FBI's Western uh, New York office and we met with the investigator and um, so we set up a meeting, the meeting took place on August 25th, and the investigator informed us that the reason for our meeting was to conduct a witness interview of my client and to determine whether or not this would be an appropriate case to bring federal criminal charges against the individual police officers that arrested Mr. Red. And since that time, uh, we've Comply. We've tried to help them with their investigation by providing all of the relevant evidence that we've been able to gather, um, which includes um, a videotape, a surveillance video from one of the convenience stores located downtown um, near the location where my client was arrested. What about the other, the other people, uh, the other, the two other students that were arrested? Um, I have no comment. Okay. And you brought up a couple of different um, operations, I guess, of, of the RPD. Sure. In the suit. Could you speak a little bit to those? Sure. So um, the operation, so Operation Cool Down, Operation Clear the Streets, and or Operation Clear the Block, those are all, um, those are all operations that were announced by the former police chief, James Shepard. Um, and he spoke extensively about those different operations on uh, WCMF over the summer, um, shortly after the Benny War incident. Um, and he spoke about the police department teaming up with local businesses to clear the area in front of local businesses of individuals that were loitering in that area. And he even acknowledged during that interview that he might be towing the line of violating individuals' constitutional rights by directing his police officers to approach them and order them to move. And so 
to us that indicates knowledge on his part that they were possibly violating the constitutional rights and I th of individuals in the city of Rochester such as my client and we think that based on that knowledge they should have taken additional steps to ensure that they were not promoting the rights of <clears throat> local businesses over the constitutional rights of individual Rochesterians. And the allegation here too is that, that you were racially profiled? Is that the case? <clears throat> we have equal protection claims and we have claims for um, one of our Monell claims involves um, basically contempt of cop arrests which disproportionately affect young African-American men, unfortunately. And that's true both in the city of Rochester and in municipalities around the country. And those again are arrests that are made not because someone has committed a specific crime, but because they weren't uh, sufficiently deferential. Correct. And, you know, the allegations specifically allege that they disproportionately impact young men of color. Crystal, why was this so important to you? Um, it was important to me not only because it was my son, but it was it 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 happens all too much in our area, um, in my community. I've been in. I was born and raised in the community. When we were younger, it was a little bit different than now. Me having children, I have three young black men, um, and I have a young daughter. And I don't want this to happen to anybody else's children. These three were um, affected, and it's all—it's a whole year later, and we're still here. It, nothing has still been done. Um, my son should be focusing on picking out what college he wants to go to, um, where he wants to spend and start his career, um, and as well as his teammates, as well as other kids that was affected by seeing them. A lot of kids look up to my son because he's not one of the problem kids in the area. You'll never hear my son name other than in the news for basketball or prior to basketball, football, or being a role model for his younger siblings and things of that nature. So it's, it's like the attorney said, it's not about money. It's about if you're supposed to protect and serve in the community, that's what you're supposed to do. My son should not have to fear from this point on should he have to go downtown or what's gonna happen when he goes downtown. He doesn't even like to go downtown anymore. He doesn't feel safe anymore. So if he feels that way, I'm quite sure other children feel that way. You know, and it shouldn't have to be that way. I just think that more training and things of that nature needs to be brought because of this case and the other ones prior to him and anyone that it happens to after him. You know, it's, it's important for my child as well as other ch children. Other people may not be as brave to come forward, but I am because I'm my son's voice. He's a child, I'm his mother. That's what I'm supposed to do. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.